it's a tantalizing prospect, he set his sights on a moral resurgence sweeping Christendom. He feels it within his grasp, and having come this far, he's not prepared to give it up. By the early 1980s, we know that the, the uh, papacy considered that more than half of the Orthodox priests in Eastern Europe were prepared to accept the primacy of the Pope. And when finally the t hour came to strike, she struck with breathtaking speed, and that's always the way the papacy does it. She prepares the groundwork. She has 1,500 years of experience. Her roots go way back into ancient Babylon. Actually, we could say far more than 1,500 years of experience because of the experience that goes back into ancient Babylon. Bob, what would you say for a person who would be wanting to um, get a little more understanding to some of these things that you've just spoke of, whereas the papacy has been involved in setting up these, these events that happen. What kind, of, what kind of reading can a person get that, that well, opens their, you know, that would give them a little more clarification on some of these situations? Okay, we're going to be looking at some of the prophecies here today, and the book Great Controversy, which I referred to there, will describe the overall view. But among the books that are being put out right now, here is a starter right here. This book, The Keys of This Blood, describes the developments that have taken place in, in uh, the drive of the Vatican for global power for years and years and years, going back to Vatican II and before. And, uh, well, we have, uh, I could just refer to a few books, and I'm planning to refer back to these later, but here's just a few since you asked the question. Here's a book entitled Unholy Trinity, the Vatican, the Nazis, and Soviet intelligence. You see, what the papacy wanted to do in the 20th century was to establish a Catholic superstate in Europe. She has wanted to regain control of the Holy Roman Empire that she mm -hmm. lost. And uh, there are some very interesting books that have been written by Roman Catholics themselves, such as the, the uh, book by uh, Penny Lerneau, which is entitled uh, The People of God, The Struggle for World Catholicism. Now, I'm not sure that I have it here, but I can tell you what the thrust of it is. Penny Lerneau was a liberal Roman Catholic, and here it is right here. Penny Lerneau. She is a liberal Roman Catholic, and the title of the book is The Struggle for World Catholicism, People of God by Penny Lerneau. Hmm. She mysteriously died for some reason. I don't know why she died. She was a young woman. You can, I've seen pictures of her. There she is when she wrote the book. Now, this book is available, these, this and the keys to this blood. Oh, you yes. should be able to go to a regular bookstore and right. pick you these up. You can order them, right. Yeah, no problem. And in this book, Penny Lerneau talks about the drive of this current pope to reestablish things the way they were hmm. before the Protestant Reformation. It is most astounding. She talks about the Curia, the Roman Catholic Curia, and how so many of them are German bishops who are from vintage of World War II, from the Nazi vintage, and how the, they are threatening liberty on a global scale. She talks about um, the various orders of the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Restoration in the United States. We have now for instance, a man, J uh, Patrick Buchanan, who ran for president of the United States in the last election, who is giving seminars now, and the seminars are uh, that the only way that the papacy can, uh, the only way that America can be saved is to become Roman Catholic. And he's holding seminars all over. He, she tells about the different orders in here and their work uh, in the hierarchy of the papacy to accomplish the goal of the papacy. And I have found out that since she wrote this book, she is dead. I don't know why she died. I haven't been able to find any information about it. But uh, at any rate, that's another book. And we'll be introducing various books as we go along. Here is a very fascinating book here the Yugoslav Auschwitz in the Vatican. And this is about, you know, people don't understand why the war is going on in Bosnia. 
Many Americans have no, not a clue, really, about that. But if I just read the back of this book, you can understand. And this is from the introduction of the book. In this collection, we are publishing documents that testify to the fact that the highest dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church gave their blessing to Ante Pavlik. He was the head of the Eustachia government at a time when the so-called independent Eustachia state of Croatia was proclaimed. You see, back in World War II, the Croatians broke away. They're the Catholic section of Yugoslavia. They broke away from Yugoslavia and they declared themselves an independent state. They aligned themselves with the Nazi government of Germany. They declared themselves a Nazi state. And then the priests and the nuns at the head of their military annihilated almost a million Serbs. Americans don't know about this. You see, mm -hmm. the media has suppressed a lot of information. Listen to this. Roman Catholic priests and monks organized mercenary troops that attacked the Yugoslav army units while the latter were also severely pressured by Hitler's divisions. Throughout the whole war and more than 150 newspapers and magazines, the church justified the fascist state under Pavlik as the work of God. So if we're talking about this power starting to control the world and every person is in it and every religion, we can see what they did in World War II because more than 150 newspapers and magazines, in these 150 newspapers and magazines, the Roman Catholic Church justified the fascist state under Pavlik as the work of God. This is the state that destroyed almost a million Serbs. The highest concentration of deaths in Europe took place there in Yugoslavia. Many Roman Catholic priests served the Eustachia state in high positions. The Pope appointed the highest military vicar for Croatia. The latter had a field chaplain in every unit of the Eustachia army. The Eustachia was the regime that was installed then in Croatia with the priests running it. The task of this field chaplain consists among other things, of repeatedly goading the Eustachia units in their mass murders of the peasant population. High dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church and of the Eustachia state together organized the mass conversion of the Orthodox Serbian population. It was a matter of convert or die. Either convert to Roman Catholicism or die. That's what we're looking at when this power gains control of the world. It has always been the history of this power of Babylon, spiritual Babylon, the papacy, which harks all the way back to ancient Babylon. Hundreds of Orthodox churches in Serbia were plundered and destroyed. The three highest dignitaries and 200 clerics were murdered in cold blood. The remainder of the clergy were driven into exile. In the concentration camp of Jasenovac, hundreds of thousands of Serbs were murdered under the command of Roman Catholic priests. In mid-year 1986, the government of the United States released documents of their counter-espionage counter activity. These reveal that the Vatican had organized a safe flight route. It was called the Rat Lines. And in fact, this, uh, this book, Unholy Trinity, talks about the Rat Lines. This is a fantastic book mm. about it. And other books talk about the Rat Lines. I remember standing in the parking lot at the seminary and talking to a fellow from South America who was attending the seminary, and he said thousands and thousands and thousands of Nazi criminals escaped through the rat lines. What they did was they hid them in monasteries and convents, and they hid them from one convent and monastery to the next until they were able to be put on a boat where they could go over to South America. And thousands of them went to South America. These reveal that the Vatican had organized a safe flight route from Europe to Argentina for Pavlik and 200 of his advisors known by name. In fact, this book tells the very building in the Vatican complex where Pavlik was hidden. Hmm. This man who is responsible for the murders of almost one million Serbs. May 5th, 1994. A primetime investigation. They were Hitler's henchmen. Now, for the first time, Argentina has opened its secret files on the Nazis. The startling truth about how many were taken in and given protection. We sent some 60,000 fugitive Nazi war criminals to Argentina. 
Tonight, Sam Donaldson gives you new details about how they escaped with the help of the Vatican and the U.S. government. And he travels from Rome to Buenos Aires to the remote Andes to track down fugitive Nazis who've been living in Argentina all these years. This former Gestapo officer accused of torture and murder. Who killed civilians in the cave? No, no, no. That was us. I think that was ordered by our command. But orders are not an excuse. Prime time. Now from Washington, Sam Donaldson. Good evening. The movie Schindler's List has rekindled the horror of Nazi Germany for Americans. But if you think it all ended some 50 years ago, you're wrong. Tonight, we're going to tell the story of how thousands of suspected Nazi war criminals escaped justice, show you where many of them are living comfortably today, and we'll bring you face to face with a former Gestapo officer who explains his crimes by saying, I was just following orders. It is a chilling story of how Nazi killers live on, but an important one to know. As the philosopher George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In the beginning, there was a madman. Adolf Hitler's Third Reich ruled the continent of Europe. Powerful, arrogant, murderous. But in the end, it all came crashing down. As the Soviets closed in on the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin, Hitler shot himself. His mistress, Eva Braun, took poison. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels first poisoned his six children, then he and his wife poisoned themselves. But what of the others who served Hitler and his murderous regime? Some were brought to trial at Nuremberg and elsewhere. But not all. Many of them just disappeared. <laughs> As it turns out, it was a disappearance well planned. Argentina, South America. It was a country off the beaten path in the mid-1940s with its own burgeoning Nazi movement. And with a former army colonel named Juan Perón in charge, a country ready to play a pivotal role in providing a safe haven for the Nazis. How many? We do not know the size of the problem. Are we talking hundreds? Are we talking thousands? I'm afraid that may be in the thousands. Last December, Argentine Foreign Minister Guido de Tella took a giant step toward exposing the truth when he signed this decree, opening the secret files of government agencies, including the federal police and the foreign ministry. Now, after all these years, the world can finally see what Argentina did. The visas were handed out just wholesale with no questions asked. There was a bit of that, yes. So the government knew that it was giving visas, allowing Nazi war criminals to come to Argentina. Some people in government certainly did. These are the archives of Argentine immigration. Everyone who registered into the country is listed here. After the war, when the Nazis began flooding in, some were so bold as to use their own names. Here's an entry from June of 1948. Schroeder, Eric Emil, says he was an engineer. Eric Schroeder was the Gestapo chief of Portugal. Some, of course, didn't use their own names. Here's an entry from July of 1950. Clement Ricardo says he was a technician. That's Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi who supervised the extermination of the Jews. And this one from June of 1949 at the very bottom of the page. Here's the name Gregor Helmut, who says he was a mechanic. Who was this mechanic? Let's see. Gregor lived in various Buenos Aires suburbs. For a time, he had a jungle hideaway nearby. But as the newly opened federal police records show, he felt safe enough after a few years to re-register under his real name, Jose Mengele, Dr. Joseph Mengele. He was no mechanic. At Auschwitz, they called him the Angel of Death. He helped select those who would live and die. He tortured and murdered children, particularly twins, with his medical experiments. Mengele is believed to have died in 1979 in Brazil. But we now have proof for the first time 
that the Argentine authorities knew about his activities in their country and protected him. There you can see his activities here in the country, how he lived with such impunity. When the archives were open, Dr. Beatrice Gurevich, research director for Jewish organizations in Buenos Aires, set to work gathering data on Nazi war criminals like Mengele. This is a document from the federal police. Those are Mengele's fingerprints? These are Mengele's fingerprints. They had him on file? Yes, of course. And the argument for not extradicting him was that Argentine didn't extradict people for political crimes. Mengele? Political crimes? So it is said in the document. Well, Dr. Mengele was one of the great butchers of all times. That was the argument. Why are you so astonished about this? This is absence of moral responsibility. But this absence of moral responsibility was not Argentina's alone. Nazi war criminals needed help to escape Europe. They got it here in Rome, beginning with two highly unlikely sources, the intelligence services of Britain and the United States. They saved tens of thousands of Nazis in order to use them against the Soviets. Peter Tompkins should know. He was a wartime spy working undercover in Rome for the American OSS, predecessor of the CIA. Are you telling me that the OSS helped Nazis escape justice at the end of, of the war? Oh, absolutely. They, they created a, a clandestine army of ex-Nazis using people like Klaus Barbie, for instance, who said, oh, that's a good Nazi, that's a good Nazi, that, I know him, I know him, I know him. But if it sounds incredible that the U.S. would use Klaus Barbie, later convicted in France as the Butcher of Léon, because he and his fellow Nazis were thought to possess experience that could help against the Soviets. Consider who else played a major role in the Nazis' escape route. None other than the Vatican. The Vatican then had an entire system of monasteries and convents. Uh, we call it the Rat Line. That was the American code word for the operation. The Rat Line. The Rat Line. John Loftus is a former Nazi hunter for the U.S. Justice Department who spent years investigating this elaborate escape route known as the Rat Line. He says Pope Pius XII was pro-German because he saw the Nazis as a bulwark against the communists, whose ideology the Pope viewed as a mortal threat to the church. So beginning in 1945, the Pope allowed one of his bishops to produce phony ID for fugitive Nazis. Bishop Alois Hudal, with the blessing of some British and U.S. government officials, set up shop in this nondescript rectory just outside the Vatican. My estimate is we sent some 60,000 fugitive Nazi war criminals to Argentina after World War II during a five-year period. But from his vantage point overlooking St. Peter's Basilica, the historian who studied that period for the Vatican, Father Robert Graham, says it was simple refugees being helped, not Nazis. Though one or two may have slipped through, of course. One or two? If, yes, 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 yes. There was no father. Thousands. There were thousands. Oh, please, please. That... No, don't, 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 kid me. don't be ridiculous. Thousands. That's absurd. To the extent that Bishop Hudal was helping fugitive Nazis, Father Graham insists the bishop was operating totally on his own. He had no. He didn't speak for the Vatican. He was a counselor in the Holy Office. Oh, please, please. That doesn't mean anything from the point of what we're talking about here. He was a friend of the Pope's. Please, are, are, are you all so simple uh, and unsophisticated as to believe that, that stuff? Please, be more intelligent than that. Give, a, uh, give the Pope uh, some, some, some credit. Did Pope Pius know what was going on? Oh, of course. But Pius, you must remember, Pius XII was scared to death of communists. Whatever Pius's role, it is, however, indisputable that the fugitive Nazi hordes came down these narrow streets looking for Bishop Hudal and his assistant, a mysterious former Nazi army lieutenant named Reinhard Kops. Reinhard Kops' job was to come up with identity documents. He needed three pieces of paper to get a Nazi war criminal smuggled out of Italy. One was a Red Cross passport, and the Vatican took care of that. The second was the Argentine visa, and Peron took care of that. And the third was an identity paper. Cops handed those out to the fugitive Nazis, so if they were arrested in Rome, they could say, well, I'm living at this monastery. I had no, no question in my mind that he had participated in the rat line, getting other Nazis out of, out of Europe. 
Rick Eaton of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which works hard to hunt down Nazi war criminals, had a tip that cops went down the rat line himself to Argentina. Posing as a neo-Nazi, Eaton found a man who called himself Juan Mahler, a writer of pro-Nazi books, with a story that sounded like cops. He said he had an office in the Vatican, and it was his job to, to get people papers. Could Juan Mahler be Reinhard Kops in hiding? We went to the Argentine Andes to a town named Bariloche, where we found the man who helped run the rat line, a 79-year-old ex-Nazi named, well, named what? Senor Mahler. I, I'm Sam Donaldson of American Television, ABC News. Yes, but what do you know? What, what do you want? Well, is, is your name Reinhard Kops? Excuse me, but I have no time for such things. Well, uh, did you help people escape here to Argentina from no, Rome? No, no, and the contrary. So your name uh, is not Reinhard Kops? No. This is not a uh, photostat of your membership in the Nazi party? No, never. I'd been a member of... Uh, on the contrary, I tell you, if they wanted to kill me, I had to flee the Nazis because I saved 25 Jews from going to, Aus to Auschwitz. But thanks to Rick Eaton's undercover work, we had a snapshot of a picture hanging in Juan Mahler's living room of a young officer being sworn into the German army that looked very much like a young Reinhard Kops. And we had a copy of Kops' Nazi party card and showed it to him. Confronted with this, the cover story cracked. You are Reinhard Kops. No, no. No? No. I was. I was in... Uh, in... Uh, when was it? 52. The German embassy here gave me the name. The name of? Of uh, Mahler. Mahler. <laughs> Mahler. Now, what was your it? name before Mahler? Uh, Kops. Kops. Your name was Kops. Yes. No, is not. He was. It's just a great difference. It, oh, it was Kops. Yes, yes. You Having admitted who he was, would he now admit what he had done? You Have you ever heard of the rat line? Something called the rat line? No, 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 no. But when we played Cops a tape Rick Eaton had made of a conversation between the two of them, in which Cops admitted that he had, in fact, helped Bishop Udall run the rat line... You work in the, for the Vatican? For the Vatican, yes. He remembered that also. I had to tell him this man had been that, that, that. And but this man is not here because he killed people at Sidon. I, I, but the bishop was the one who helped organize this system whereby Nazi war criminals came to Argentina. Yes, I, yes, and you I helped know, him. I know now that it was something like that. But in those times, I did not know. But why would Cops himself need to disappear to Argentina under a false name? There is some evidence that by the end of the war, he was commander of an intelligence unit in Yugoslavia, which had the job of eliminating anti-Nazi partisans. I was not in, in Yugoslavia, Albania, in the SS. Clearly, Kops gives up his secrets only grudgingly. But watch how he treats others' secrets. There's a lot of people here still Nazi. A lot, I tell you. Who are they? Kops pulled us a few feet up the sidewalk and turned his back on the cameras and told us what we wanted to know. His name is Pripke, P-R-I-P-K-E, Erich Pripke. Actually, we already knew about Pripke. We had him under surveillance. He's the man in the restaurant wearing the yellow sweater. We knew he was part of a shocking story. But would he admit to it? Senor Pripke, Sam Donaldson of American Television. Yes. Senor Pripke, yes. Can we talk to you for just a moment? Yes. In a moment, the true story of that man, one of Hitler's killers, as told by him and by the relatives of his victims. Why should the world care now about the old Nazis and what they did 50 years ago? Well, listen to the story of what one of them did, and then ask the question again. A thousand miles south of Buenos Aires, in the shadow of the Andes Mountains, lies a little piece of Germany. Bariloche, Argentina, feels like it belongs in Bavaria. And that's no accident, because many Germans moved here after World War II. One of them was Erich Pripka, once a captain in the dreaded Nazi SS, now an 80-year-old grandfather. Uh, you were in the Gestapo in 1944, were you not? In Rome? Yes, in Rome, yes. How do you feel about the Nazi party now? No, I'm glad that it's over. 
I finished with the Nazis at 45, you see. Today, Eric Pripka lives quietly. He is prominent in the German community in Baralochi, chairman of the Cultural Association. He is soft-spoken and kindly looking. But what was he like back then? What kind of a man was Kripke? Well, to get a little more insight on that, all you have to do is visit the Museum for the Liberation of Rome here on the Via Tasso. You see, this building used to be the Gestapo Interrogation Center, and it was here that Eric Kripke did some of his cruelest work. Elvira Sabatini is the curator of this museum. In 1944, her husband was picked up and locked in this tiny cell for a month. He thought he was going to die and scratched his will on the plaster wall. He almost did die. Your husband was tortured here? Yes, many times. By Kapler and by Pribke. Pribke? Pribke too, yes. He hit him often with brass knuckles. He was very controlled, very cold. Peter Tompkins, the American spy posing as an Italian, actually met Pribke at a party. He was charming, uh, cold, uh, personable, good-looking, impeccably uniformed. Capable of murder? <laughs> he, he's involved in, in the massacre three days later. He, 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 he was in the Ardea team caves butchering 335 people. These are the Ardea team caves of Rome, today a memorial complete with rows and rows of coffins. On March 24, 1944, a place of mass murder. Piera and Vera Simoni, sisters now in their 70s, come here often to remember what happened here to their father. And then over here, the bodies were stacked? All this, yes. Did you find your father here? Yes. They, the workmen found. And had been shot. And yes. that has been shot. This was what it looked like when the Allies, who had pushed the Germans out of Rome, found the bodies three months later. How many bodies? 335. All civilians. The prisoners were brought there in trucks with their hands tied behind their backs. Peter Tompkins also has a reason to visit the caves. Back in 1944, he was a U.S. spy working undercover in Rome. Among the victims of the massacre, were 22 of his Italian agents. He attended their autopsies. And then they were taken in five at a time where Kapler's NCOs and officers shot each one in the back of the neck uh, with one shot and made them kneel, made the next successive five kneel on top of the others so the corpses accumulated, which is, it, it, it's a scene so horrifying, it, it's hard to believe. Herbert Kapler, a lieutenant colonel, was the Gestapo chief in Rome, assigned to carry out the massacre. Eric Pribka, a captain, was Kapler's second in command, according to this U.S. intelligence report obtained by Prime Time. After the war, Kapler was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Pribka escaped from a prisoner of war camp in 1946 and disappeared until we found him in Argentina just a month ago. Surprisingly, perhaps, he told us at least part of the story of the massacre of Rome. You know, the, the communists blow up to a, a group of our uh, German soldiers. Yes. For every German soldier, ten, ten Italians had to die. Civilians? Well, civilians, they have been, no, they have been morally uh, terrorists. But children were killed? No, not at all. Fourteen-year-old no. boys were no. killed? In fact, a 14-year-old and two 15-year-olds were shot that day. Men in their 70s shot that day. A priest shot that day. And of the 335 victims, 70 were Jewish. All the family of my mother. All the family? Oh, yes. Seven persons of the same family, three generations in the same day. Giulia Spizzuccino's family was Jewish. Her grandfather and 26 members of his family were killed by the Nazis. 18 women and children were loaded aboard trains and sent to Auschwitz. And when they arrived, immediately after nine days, they went to the gas chambers, not one, 
of them returned. And the men? The seven men were killed to the cave of the Atene. You were there when they were shot, the civilians? I had some, uh, yes, the first ones, yes, I saw them, yes. But why did you shoot them? They had not done anything. Yes. You know, that was our order. You know, in the war, you know that that, that, that kind of uh, things happened, you know? You were just following orders? Yes, you know, of course, yes, yes. But I didn't shoot anybody. Didn't shoot anybody? That's not what he said when he gave this statement while being held in a POW camp in 1946. Then, Pripka admitted shooting two people. I went in with the second or third party and killed a man with an Italian machine pistol. Towards the end, I killed another man with the same machine pistol. How do you feel inside about what oh, you did? Oh, I feel very bad. Nobody from us wanted to do that, you know? But you killed civilians in the cave. No, no, no. You that told was me you were there. Thing. Yes, I was there, but that was the other thing that was ordered by our command. But orders are not an excuse. Oh, well, at this time, order was an order, you mean, you see? And you carried it out? Maybe I had to carry it in order, yes. And civilians yeah. died? Civilians died, yes. Many civilians died. On all parts in the world, still they are dying. And now you tell me you feel sorry for it? Very sorry, very sorry, very sorry. He is a liar. We think he represents today all the bad that was there. It was a cruelty. He says he's sorry. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, enough. You say you feel very bad about what happened? Yes, very bad. Very, really very bad. Why didn't you stand up then and say, I will not do it. I will not shoot these civilians. Uh, you live in this time, but we did live in 1933. Mm. Understand that? Whole Germany was in it. They all, they want, nobody won't speak about it now. But the most part of Germany was Nazi. You were a Nazi. I was a young man. I was a Nazi. Young man. Then I was a young man. Do you think because you were a young man you should be excused for what you did? No. I, many, many young men do things when they are old men like me now. They are very sorry about it. But should old men not pay for the crimes they committed? Well, we didn't uh, commit a crime. We, 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 we did what we ordered us, you know. That was not a crime. That was a... Shooting Italian. civilians in time of war is against all international yes, conventions. today, but not in this time. So, Priebke participated in a massacre and in torture of civilians. But there's even more. Did you deport Jews to concentration camps? You? No, no, nobody, no. Never? No, never. You never worked with Eichmann? No, no. I was to the end in uh, Rome. Do you consider yourself a war criminal? No, no, no. I, I never killed a man uh, because he was a Jew, you see? Well, what does the record say about that? In London, at the Public Records Office, we found files which show that after his escape in 1946, the British, French, Italian, and American governments were all looking for Pribka as a suspected war criminal. In Berlin, the West Germans had allegations that he was involved in the deportation of some six to 7,000 Jews from Italy to the death camps. And just two days ago in Jerusalem, Israeli Holocaust researchers uncovered Gestapo documents from Pripka's office authorizing arrests for Judenaktion, the deportation of Jews under the authority of SS Department 4B, the department headed by Adolf Eichmann who was eventually kidnapped from Argentina by the Israelis, tried and executed for his crimes. How do you feel about the fact that six million Jews were executed, killed? Yeah, no, I feel very sorry about it. I'm very, very sorry, because uh, it's terrible to kill <coughs> men, women, and children. But you did it. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I never was against Jews. I'm from Berlin. We lived together in Berlin with many Jews. Kripke was a captain in the SS. He volunteered for that. He liked Hitler's policy. Rabbi Marvin Heyer is dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Nazi hunting center. He thought there was something good about the idea that the Jews are the Untermenschen. So it's preposterous for him to look into the camera and say now, oh no, he likes Jews. He has nothing against Jews. I mean, that's ridiculous. So why was Eric Pripka not tried on the allegations he had sent Jews to their death? Remember, he escaped. And until we found him, the authorities didn't know where he was. However, now in Berlin, 
the Pripka file can still be reopened. Ursula Sof is the deputy prosecutor there for the investigation of Nazi crimes. The fact that he was accused in the past of being responsible for deportations indicates he could eventually be convicted here in Germany. Now the man has been found. Now the onus is on Germany to say, we're opening the case, we want him extradited, and now's the time for Argentina to say, we're putting him on a plane. And if Germany should say it wants to try him now, Argentine Foreign Minister Guido de Tella says he's ready. Well, if someone comes forward and demonstrates that you are harboring someone who is a Nazi war criminal, what action would you take? We would extradite him. You would extradite the individual? Yes. To be judged in whichever country he comes from. When we talked to Eric Pripka, he did not seem worried. He lives under his own name. He spoke to us freely. But by the end of the interview, he sounded unhappy. You came over me, right? For right, that's it. Not a nice man as you did. It. You are not a gentleman. I'm not a gentleman. So why not leave Eric Pripka alone to live out his long life unmolested by prosecutors and juries? Well, first of all, for the future, <clears throat> so that would-be murderers who are born tomorrow won't get the idea that if you're clever enough to hide out, crimes against humanity can be rewarded by society. But also, Rabbi Heyer adds, for the past. Remember the faces of the doomed victims, and then ask the question, why should the world care? Fifty years after a madman and his henchmen inflicted unspeakable horrors on humanity, there is new shame among those who sheltered the criminal. The phenomenon did exist, was significant. There was connivance and we are ashamed. Old anger in those who will never forget. They have not faced the bar of justice, and time cannot be their refuge. And unrelenting pain over loved ones lost. Listen, I don't want revenge, but I want justice. And I will never forgive them. Never. There is no certainty, of course, that Germany will ask for Eric Pribka's extradition. But at least with Argentina now cooperating, he and thousands of other Nazis who may still be living there must rest less easily. And perhaps for some, there will come a day of reckoning after all. For our part, we'll stay on the case. The fascists hid frequently during their flight in cloisters and in many instances disguised themselves as Franciscan monks. And here's documents on massacres under the leadership of priests. There are the actual documents in the book, uh, copies of them. Uh, the massacres, the mass murders, the Eustachia state, state of Catholicism, decorations for Roman Catholic priests for meritorious service, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, this is an astounding, astounding book. And the Roman Catholic priests welcomed the destruction of Yugoslavia. So why do you think the Serbs are fighting the way they are today? They don't want the same thing to happen again. Exactly the same process is happening in Europe again. Germany has many Roman Catholics in high positions in it right now. Notice you, Germany has been united now. And many feared what that might mean for Europe. I'm a German, half German. But my ancestors fled Germany a long time ago, and they went into the Ukraine and then came over here to the United States searching for religious liberty. And many Germans did at that time, uh, thousands and tens of thousands of them. But, but there is a strong Roman Catholic element in Germany, and Lutheranism has come so close to the papacy now that Roman Catholics are saying it's only a matter of time now and we'll be one again. Right. And so what has happened now is Croatia has broken away from Yugoslavia, declared itself an independent state, just like it did 50 years ago. And all of a sudden, there's war. There's war. The Serbs were afraid of seeing the same pattern happening as happened 50 years ago. And we are getting largely the Croatian side of the story in our newspapers here. Only a few papers in Europe are carrying the other side of the story. And, for instance, I can just give you an illustration from a friend of mine that lives in Hungary. He's explored some of this, and he says that, for instance, when UN convoys went in to deliver food, the Serbs discovered that the UN convoys had arms and weapons for the Croatians. 
So they said, we can't let you through. But what was, what was reported in the Western press was, the Serbs are keeping food from coming to the people who need mm. it. You see, that's how the distortion takes place. Same distortion took place 50 years ago. And there are books that have been written on it, such as the book Convert or Die. Here's a whole section on the Pope's attitude toward the, toward the massacres, the role of the papal legate Marconi, eyewitness testimonies about the compulsory conversions. You see, this is a microcosm of what is going to happen when this power achieves control over the entire world, the papacy. And I have found out that since she wrote this book, she is dead. I don't know why she died. I haven't been able to find any information about it. But uh, at any rate, that's another book. And we'll be introducing various books as we go along. Here is a very fascinating book here, The Yugoslav Auschwitz in the Vatican. And this is about, you know, people don't understand why the war is going on in Bosnia. Many Americans have no, not a clue really about that. But if I just read the back of this book, you can understand. And this is from the introduction of the book. In this collection, we are publishing documents that testify to the fact that the highest dignitaries of the Roman Catholic Church gave their blessing to Ante Pavlik. He was the head of the Eustachian government at a time when the so-called independent Eustachia state of Croatia was proclaimed. You see, back in World War II, the Croatians broke away. They're the Catholic sections. And uh, there are some very interesting books that have been written by Roman Catholics themselves, such as the, the uh, book by uh, Penny <coughs> Lerneau, which is entitled uh, The People of God, The Struggle for World Catholicism. Now, I'm not sure that I have it here, but I can tell you what the thrust of it is. Penny Lerneau was a liberal Roman Catholic. And here it is, right here. Penny Lerneau. She is a liberal Roman Catholic. And the title of the book is The Struggle for World Catholicism, People of God by Penny Lerneau. Hmm. She mysteriously died for some reason. I don't know why she died. She was a young woman. You can, I have seen pictures of her. There she is when she wrote the book. Now, this book is available, these, this and the keys to this blood, oh, you yes. should be able to go to a regular bookstore and right, pick you these up. You can order them, right. Yeah, no problem. And in this book, Penny Lerneau talks about the drive of this current pope to reestablish things the way they were hmm. before the Protestant Revolution. Involved in setting up these, these events that happen. What kind, of, what kind of reading can a person get that, that well, opens their you know, that would give them a little more clarification on some of these situations. Okay, we're going to be looking at some of the prophecies here today, and the book Great Controversy, which I referred to there, will describe the overall view. But among the books that are being put out right now, here is a starter right here. This book, The Keys of This Blood, describes the developments that have taken place in, in uh, the drive of the Vatican for global power, for years and years and years, going back to Vatican II and before. And, uh, well, we have, uh, I could just refer to a few books, and I'm planning to refer back to these later, but here's just a few since you asked the question. Here's a book entitled Unholy Trinity, The Vatican, the Nazis, and Soviet Intelligence. You see, what the papacy wanted to do in the 20th century was to establish a Catholic superstate in Europe. She has wanted to regain control of the Holy Roman Empire that she mm -hmm. lost. Affirmation. It is most astounding. She talks about the Curia, the Roman Catholic Curia, and how so many of them are German bishops who are from vintage of World War II, from the Nazi vintage, and how the, they are threatening liberty on a global scale. She talks about um, the various orders of the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Restoration in the United States. We have now, for instance, a man, J uh, Patrick Buchanan, who ran for President of the United States in the last election, who is giving seminars now, and the seminars are uh, that the only way that the papacy can, uh, the only way that America can be saved is to become Roman Catholic. 
and he's holding seminars all over. He, she tells about the different orators in here and their work uh, in the hierarchy of the papacy to accomplish the goal of... It's a tantalizing prospect. He set his sights on a moral resurgence sweeping Christendom. He feels it within his grasp, and having come this far, he's not prepared to give it up. By the early 1980s, we know that the, the uh, papacy considered that more than half of the Orthodox priests in Eastern Europe were prepared to accept the primacy of the Pope. And when finally the t hour came to strike, she struck with breathtaking speed, and that's always the way the papacy does it. She prepares the groundwork. She has 1,500 years of experience. Her roots go way back into ancient Babylon. Actually, we could say far more than 1,500 years of experience because of the experience that goes back into ancient Babylon. Bob, what would you say for a person who would be wanting to um, get a little more understanding to some of these things that you've just spoke of, whereas the papacy has been... In